Beloved in the Lord Jesus Christ, my message to you this hour of worship deals with the subject, Nicodemus, this is Jesus. It is based on John 3, the verses 1 and 2, where we read as follows. Now there was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. This man came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher come from God, for no one can do these signs that you do unless God is with him. Then there are the friends of Nicodemus. Nicodemus' fellow Pharisees were sure that Jesus was a fraud, not only a fraud, but an insurrectionist. Jesus was, they said among themselves in Nicodemus' hearing, a man who was obstructing the establishment, that is, what little there was left of it, Someday in the future the Messiah, spoken of by the prophets, would come. He would cast off the Roman yoke. He would make the land really flow with milk and honey. Then the paradise of which Moses had spoken, the paradise of the past, would be the paradise of the future, the paradise for them and through them to all men. And now this peasant from Galilee presumes to tell us the experts in Moses and the prophets that what Moses and the prophets meant about the past and the future paradise was something totally different from what the most advanced thinking of the age knows it to be. He sets his literalistic interpretation over against what we all know scripture must mean and what a misery these literalists have caused throughout all the past. Now then there are these absurd claims of Jesus that we must speak of first. This mere man, this man from Galilee, and can anything good come from Galilee, claims that he is one with the Father, one with God. Do you not realize, Nicodemus, that in saying this, this man speaks blasphemy? You know what Moses said, Behold, the Lord thy God is one God. There can be only one God, even the peoples about us, especially the Greeks, which which some of our fathers have had some dealings since the time of Ezra and Nehemiah, agree with us in this. The great Greek philosopher Socrates, Plato, and Aristotle hold that there is only one God. Even these pagan philosophers knew that polytheism, the service of many gods that become men and lived among men, is a thing of the past. Even Plato and Aristotle knew there is only one God and that this God is wholly unknown and unknowable. Even they knew that everything that any man says about this one God as creating and redeeming the world is only an imagination, construction of some dreamer among men. No one knows anything about God. Surely if we as a nation are to be true seed of Abraham, if through us the promise God made to Abraham is to be fulfilled, that in him all nations should be blessed, then we must not fall back into polytheism as this peasant of Galilee wants us to do. Nobody knows God, therefore we know that what this Jesus says about God is wrong. Are you going to go against the course of evolution in human thought? And how, Nicodemus, do you suppose that future glorious paradise to which we all look forward, you as well as we, will ever be realized for us men and for our salvation unless we ourselves as men take part in the building of it, and especially as we, the chosen people of God, Take, uh, take the lead in the building of it. We must make ourselves worthy partners of that unknown God as he strives to make all things, even evil, subject to his beneficent direction. This is what Moses and the prophet really meant when Moses spoke of us being the creatures of God. He meant this to signify that we are finite participants in the being of God. This is what the Greeks meant. This is what our fathers mean. God is our senior partner, our elder brother, our leader, the elected president of the universe. He will do the best he can in the face of overwhelming odds to make all things come out well. How he'll do this, we do not know, but we believe in him. As God's chosen nation, we must lead the nations about us toward this ideal state, this perfect state, this paradise regained. And now here this upstart from Galilee taking Moses and the prophets literally. He is trying to tell us that the world was literally created by God. We know that this is not true because it cannot be true. It's not logical 
for then God would once upon a time in the past not have been a creator, and then after that he would become a creator, and then God would not be eternal and unchangeable in his being, in his wisdom, in his power, in his goodness, and in his truth. If we took the idea of creation literally, we should have to think of ourselves as puppets or as muppets. We would not be free. And how can we then be responsible unless we are free? That's logical, if anything is logical. And then, mind you, this Jesus you are interested in, Nicodemus, not only takes the story of creation, but also of the fall of Adam, literally. But surely he cannot have it both ways. If we are created beings, then we are wholly derivative. Then our wills mean nothing. Then we are puppets. But now he says that we are sinners against, as well as creatures of, this God. He says that we have done what is contrary to the will of God. Thus he says on the one hand that we cannot do anything contrary to his will, since it is the will of God that controls everything. And then he says that because of our setting our wills against the will of God, we are going to be eternally punished. He speaks of a worm that dieth not, and of a fire that will not be quenched. Let him go there himself if he so desires, but we are not going there. We're not going to have our house eaten by termites of temporalism. And then he thinks he is the Messiah. Bah! He thinks this of himself. He says that he himself is that promised Messiah, the one of whom Moses and the prophets spoke. He says that in him the 53rd chapter of Isaiah will be fulfilled. He will be wounded for our transgressions and bruised for our iniquities. By his stripes we are to be healed. Did you hear the latest? Last week, Tuesday, he said, He that believeth on me, out of his heart rivers of water shall flow. This implies that we do not come to him in abject subjection. We shall be cast out into outer darkness, where he says there is weeping and gnashing of teeth. Mind you, he said that he himself is to be the final judge of men, and therefore also of us. Nicodemus, you imagine yourself being judged by this peasant of Galilee? The Father, he says, has sent him into the world to save his people from their sins, to be sure, but only his elect crew are to be saved. The rest of us, though we are all children of Abraham, are to be the goats at his left in the day of judgment. All this acabradabra, you know, this stark literalism he's pouring down the throats of these people that are know nothing and are cursed of God. Of course, the pay, people take it in by gulps. They love to have it so. See those twelve peasants following him all around? They are expecting to sit on the twelve thrones of Israel. They think that they will replace us. They will take over the White House of the universe. They will be his cabinet. One of them is going to be the Secretary of State. Perhaps it's Peter or John. They think that they are special favorites of this man. One of them, John, says, of himself, that he is the disciple who was laying on Jesus' breast. The rest of us will be driven to the hinterland of darkness and of death. Why should you pay any attention to him, Nicodemus? Study the congressional record and see whether any such good thing has ever come out of Galilee. This is the relevance of Scripture to put him to death. But Nicodemus cannot sleep. Nicodemus could not sleep of nights. Night after night he tossed on his pillow, his conscience troubling him. Deep down in his heart Nicodemus knew that he was a creature of God. Deep down in his heart he also knew that he was a sinner against God. The more articulately his fellow Pharisees developed their reasons for rejecting Jesus and his claims, the more obvious it seemed to become to Nicodemus that these reasons were based on a fraud. Deep down in his heart he knew that he deserved eternal punishment for his sins by God. I will go to Jesus, he said to himself. I will talk to him as to a fellow man. He too, no doubt, has his problems. He, no doubt, has the same problems that we all have. But there is something strange about this man. There is a ring of truth about what he says, and there is a ring of falsity about what we, as Pharisees, say. If it is true that no man knows anything about God, is not then his guess at least as good as is ours? Is it then not possible that he is speaking the truth? I am impressed by what this man Jesus says. I am also impressed by what he does. 
Surely what he does for the healing of men cannot all be attributed to a desire to show himself to be some great one. I saw that widow's son raised from the dead. I saw Jairus' daughter, too, after she was raised from death. If what we Pharisees say about death is true, namely that all ends in death and death ends all, that all being is being unto death, how then can he raise men from the dead? Are his words the words of a stargazer, or are his works the works of a mere magician? So Nicodemus goes to call on Jesus. At last the night arrived. It was very dark, but Nicodemus has checked on the place where Jesus was accustomed to pray of nights. Jesus prayed of nights, not because, like Nicodemus, he could not sleep, but so that others might sleep not the sleep of death, but the sleep that comes from a clear conscience with God. Rabbi, Rabbi, kindly let me interrupt your petitions and thanksgiving to your Father. I am a man in great agony of spirit. I am a Pharisee. You know what that means in the way of hostility to your person and of opposition to your program of work, but I am impressed by what you have said and by what you have done. Are you willing to give me an hour of your time for prayer to tell me what you really think of us and of our way of seeking the blessing of Abraham, I have heard you often. I have heard you say that we shut up the kingdom against men and we shall not enter into it ourselves because we do not allow others who would enter to go in. Just yesterday you said, Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you traverse sea and land to make a single proselyte and when he becomes a proselyte, you make him twice as much a child of hell as yourselves. You call us blind guides and blind fools. The day before that, you said that we are not only blind ourselves, but that we blind other men. I heard you call the people, come unto me, and not to Pharisees. I, not they, will give you rest, for my yoke is easy, and my burden is light, theirs is heavy. How can you possibly mean what you say by all this? Can you really mean to claim that you are one with the Father, that there is therefore more than one God? Can you really mean that you are the way, the truth, and the life? Do you really mean that you will sit as judge on the last day and send all of us who have not taken you at your word into the darkness of death, where there shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth? But Jesus quietly replies to Nicodemus, Rising from his knees, Jesus answered Nicodemus quietly, Yes, Nicodemus, I meant exactly what I said yesterday and what I have said from the beginning of my ministry in the midst of the people. You are, all of you Pharisees, blind guides. You search the scriptures because you think that in them you have eternal life, and it is they that bear witness of me. Yet you refuse to come to me that you may have life. Do I call you blind fools because I hate you? No, it is because I want you to repent and to be saved. Do not think that I shall accuse you with the Father. It is Moses, the Scriptures, who accuse you, on whom you have set your hope. If you believe Moses and the Scriptures, you would believe in me. But if you do not believe his writings, how will you believe my words? For God sent the Son into the world, not to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. For God so loved the world that he sent his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. I am that light of life of whom Moses and the prophets spake. I am not believing in me. You reject Moses and the prophets. I am the light of the world in not believing in me and in not proclaiming me. As such, you leave men in darkness and lead them into ever greater darkness. Yes, indeed, Nicodemus, you Pharisees, and you too, as well as the others, unless you too repent, are blind guides of the blind. I cannot retract this statement. It is true. What is worse, that you are not blind by accident, but blind by choice. You are willfully blind. You try each day to put out the light of the sun in the heavens. You've taken out your own eyes and therefore cannot bear to have the light of the sun to shine on you. You hate me because I tell you the truth. You love the lie rather than the truth. You are of your father, the father of lies, and the deceiver of men. But in saying all this about your, the Pharisees, I want to save you. I have come to seek and to save men. 
that are lost in the darkness and bitterness of death. <clears throat> you cannot as much begin to save yourself. You must be born again. You must be born from above. No one can come to me except the Father draw him, and no one can come to me of his own will except through the Son who gives him life. You think you are free because you are Abram's seed. Verily, I say unto you, Nicodemus, you are not Abram's seed unless you come to me. You have lived in self-deception all your days. That is why you are weary and heavy laden. That is why you cannot come asleep at all. How much worse the situation is than you have ever dreamed of it as being. You are not merely unfortunate because of circumstances. You are guilty. You are unrighteous. You are lawbreakers. You are therefore subject to death, eternal death. But Nicodemus also, how much better things are than you have ever dreamed of them as being. I have come to seek and to save that which is lost. Do you know Lazarus? He lives down the street with his sisters, Mary and Martha. Soon he will become sick and die. Then I will come and raise him from the dead. I will have men open the tomb. I will call out to him, Lazarus, I say unto thee, come forth. Will Lazarus hear and come out? You ask, how can a grown man be born again? You think that what I teach about myself is absurd? I will give Lazarus ears with which to hear, and my voice, as I call to him, will give him strength to obey my command. Yes, you must be born again, as Lazarus is born physically again, so you must be born spiritually from the dead. With men this is impossible, but with God all things are possible. All power is given unto me. I am one with the Father. I am also one with the Spirit. The Spirit will give you new birth. Go home now, Nicodemus. Read Moses and the prophets afresh. We have not time to go over them together now. You must teach your class this morning, I know, but just try it. In the few moments remaining before the sun dawns upon us in the heavens, read your scriptures in the light of what I have told you, and that look me in the light of what the scriptures say. Then you will see that they speak of me. Then you will realize that what I meant when I said that it is not I that will condemn you with its judgment, but your own scriptures, which you claim to have understood but have misread all the time. This is the relevance of the scriptures to you, Nicodemus. Think for a moment of what Moses says about the men on earth before the time of the flood. Moses says that at the beginning Adam, our common forefather, walked and talked with God in paradise. Moses tells us that Adam broke the ordinances of God for him as made in the image of God. Then God drove him out of paradise, but God promised that the seed of the woman would destroy the seed of the serpent, the followers of Satan. That promised seed of the woman am I. I am the second Adam, not only to undo what he has done, but to establish righteousness for men and open the gateway of prayer, access to the Heavenly Father. It was in me that Enoch believed and was taken out of this present world with whom he had walked while he was on earth. It was in me that Noah believed when he had found grace in the sight of God. You ask Nicodemus how these things can be, how a grown man can be born as a babe. I did not speak of physical birth. I spoke of the radical change of heart. I speak now of a heart in which them in which true love of God has replaced satanic hatred of God. Because of their fall in Adam, even the children of Seth hated God. They hated God because God frowned upon their sinful ways. Did God then forsake the world? No, he did not. He told Noah, who, like Seth, walked with God to become a preacher of righteousness. God appeared to Noah by night and told him to build an ark for the saving of his house and through the saving of his house for the saving of the world. But I must hurry on. The first ray of the sun are appearing on the eastern sky. So too, Nicodemus, the light of life is beginning to dawn upon your soul. Noah was building the ark. Through him God was with great patience for a long time, calling men to repentance. Noah's carpenters came to him one night and asked him, How can these things be? But you actually mean to float this ark when we have applied the last bit of pitch to keep the water out? Will all the hills and mountains, even this high mountain, someday be covered with a flood? 
How can these things be? They simply cannot be. Yes, said Noah, you do not understand how these things can be. With God all things are possible. I do not understand them myself. I am a man like yourself. But I have been told by God who appeared to me and told me that a flood is coming that will destroy all men because of their sin against them. All men have corrupted themselves. In their hearts they are like Cain who slew his brother. Now they live a life of open corruption. They are covenant breakers in their hearts. They are covenant breakers in their practice. Now I am letting them reap the fruits of their own policy of life. Do you now see what Moses really means, Nicodemus? He means the opposite of what you Pharisees have made him out to mean. God appeared to Noah, who had received grace in the sight. He told Noah to warn men of universal judgment coming in the future because of their rebellion and hatred of their Creator, Redeemer, God. He told them that their hatred of God, their Creator, is ingrained in their very being since their fall in Adam, and that their immoral practice only manifests this hatred of God. Noah told them they must repent, and that of themselves they cannot repent, because they will not repent. Only by the grace of God, such as Noah had received, can they repent. How can these things be? Now you see that not I, but Moses will condemn you for not coming to me. I am the ark of God. You have come to me, Nicodemus, because the Father has drawn you. Ere long your friends, the Pharisees, will nail me to the cross. How utterly self-deceived they will then show themselves to have been. How utterly self-deceived will Satan, their leader, then show himself to be. My kingdom, the kingdom of righteousness, of life will be established even through their wicked acts of crucifying me, when Satan thinks that at last he is victorious because he has brought me to a cruel death, then in that very moment and through that very deed, and in spite of all his evil intentions, I will finish my work of saving my people from their sin and from the wrath to come. Goodbye, Nicodemus. You now realize that it was the Father who drew you to come to me, and that it is through the new birth from above that the scales have been removed from your eyes. Go now, Nicodemus, go now, or you will be seen by some of your friends. Or do you now no longer worry about his question of being seen by your friends? One day soon you will confess my name before men, and then on the final day of judgment I will confess your name with the Father. Goodbye, Nicodemus. I too must go. There is the leper now whom I must cleanse this morning at nine o'clock. This afternoon at four I will hear that pill, heal that paralytic to be let down before me through the roof. I will forgive his sins even before healing his body. Your friends will see this, and filled with hatred they will call me a blasphemer. Let us pray together, Nicodemus, before you leave. I thank thee, Father and Lord of heaven and earth, that thou hast hid these things from the wise and the understanding, and revealed them to babes. Yea, Father. For such was thy gracious will. Time passed quickly after this. Jesus raised Lazarus from the dead, said Caiaphas to his partners in self-deceit. You understand nothing at all. Why hesitate? Away with him. Not on a holiday. There is no telling what those Jewish freaks, Jesus freaks, may do. On a holiday, they get all excited. Get Pilate to condemn him as a political insurrectionist. Soon Jesus was hanging on the cross. At a distance stood Mary, his mother, in agony over the son of her womb, but far more than that, in joy because he was the Savior of her soul. There, too, stood Nicodemus. He did not scoff with his fellow Pharisees. He saved others. Himself he cannot save. Let him come down from the cross now, and we will follow him. Oh, no, Nicodemus listened with utmost fascination. To the words that came from the mouth of his Savior, the Father had drawn him, the Son said, It is finished for him, and the Spirit had given him a new birth. But what does he hear? One of the malefactors speaks, Lord, remember me when thou art come into thy kingdom, and now hear the answer of the one who was scorned and rejected of men. This day thou shalt be with me in paradise. Nicodemus rushes home. Again he cannot sleep. This time he cannot sleep for exuberance of joy. Early in the morning he's out with myrrh and aloes and cassia, a hundred pounds weight of it, to express his love for, his, for Jesus, his Savior now. How can these things be? 
Now he knew, now he understood that nothing else can be unless these things be first. My friends, if you have not come to Jesus, come to him. In the morning he's out with myrrh and aloes and cassia, a hundred pounds weight of it, to express his love for, his, for Jesus, his Savior now. How can these things be? Now he knew, now he understood that nothing else can be unless these things be first. My friends, if you have not come to Jesus, come to him by night, come this night. Jesus told the Pharisees that Moses and the prophets spake of him. That's all they did. He now says that you, that not only Moses and the prophets, but his apostles speak of him to you. Jesus said the Pharisees that not he but Moses would condemn them if they did not come to him. It is through and by the light of God has given men in the scriptures that they will be judged. You will be judged by that greater light that even Moses and the prophets gave to Nicodemus. You will be judged by what the apostles who walked and talked with Jesus and handled the word of life say to you. Said the apostle Paul of Jesus, he who knew no sin was made a sin for us that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. He who was rich became poor, that through his poverty we might be made rich. How can these things be? Nothing else can be unless these things be. Modern science has no light unless it receives its light from him through whom and to whom are made all things. Modern philosophy has no wisdom unless it comes from him who is made for us unto wisdom and righteousness and full redemption. Every candle that gives forth light gives it forth because it receives it from the sun. Every bit of light that any man can shed on anything comes from the sun of righteousness. All wisdom that comes not of, has not its origin in Christ has been made and is being made foolishness with God. Here, my friends, is the relevance of Scripture to you. Is there any relevance in the light of the sun? Man cannot live or move or have his being. He cannot go forth to his labor all the day except the sun shine upon him. Do you not understand how these things can be? There is no understanding unless these things be. Do you think there is no mystery if you follow the wisdom of this world? There is darkness perpetual, the darkness of those who have taken out their own eyes, unless you have this light through the home, one who spoke to Nicodemus that night. After Nicodemus went home from the crucifixion, he again could not sleep. He could not sleep now because he was burdened for his fellow Pharisees who had taken out their own eyes so that they could not see and who would not repent but scoffed at Jesus while he was hanging on the cruel cross. He had often spoken with them about Jesus. How can you still say that he blasphemed all his days? I have cast in my lot with him and I am not now ashamed of him. He will confess me before the Father, because I now confess him even before you, who even at this moment hate him, and you will hate him, unless you too come to Jesus and fall, at, fall at your, on your face before him and say, for God, Father, forgive me, because I have hated thee. Forgive me. Give me thy spirit. Give me a new heart. Create in me a right and true heart, so that I too, as Nicodemus, believe. Soon he will openly appear as your judge and as my judge. Then he will, unless you now repent, send you to a physical crucifixion, oh no, but to everlasting death where there is weeping and gnashing of teeth, where the worm dieth not and the fire is not quenched. Then his word, the word spoken by Moses and the prophets, and the word spoken by his apostles will condemn you. It was his word speaking through them that you have rejected. Was it because Nicodemus spoke thus to his fellow Pharisees that we read that many of them believed? As where the days of Noah show the cell the days of the Son of Man be, men will be eating and drinking, they will be marrying and giving in marriage, or be paying the more attention to the holy ordinances of God with respect to marriage, when suddenly the sign of the Son of Man will appear on the clouds. Then you will call upon the mountains to cover you, from the wrath of the Lamb. This is the relevance of Scripture to you. Nothing is relevant to anything unless the Scripture be seen as the word of the Redeemer God, calling men to himself to repentance from sin, even unto eternal life. 
For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world. He who believes in him is not condemned. He who does not believe in him is condemned already, because he has not believed in the name of the only Son of God. Herein lies the relevance of Scripture to you. It is the relevance of God, the relevance of the Spirit, the Holy Spirit, calling to you himself. And now, beloved congregation of Jesus Christ, receive the benediction. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. Amen. The lecture that you've just heard comes to you from the Mount Olive Presbyterian Church Tape Library at Post Office Box 142, Bassfield, Mississippi, 39421. These messages or lectures are used with permission of the Westminster Theological Seminary in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. Westminster Theological Seminary was founded in 1929 and is located on a 22-acre campus in the Chestnut Hill area of Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. The faculty of 15 professors serve a student body of over 300. The seminary has as its purpose the formation of men for the gospel ministry as pastors, evangelists, and teachers who shall truly believe and cordially love that system of religious belief and practice which is set forth in the Westminster Confession of Faith and Catechisms and which is involved in the fundamental principles of Presbyterian church government. The seminary has as a subordinate aims the provision of theological training for other church officers and members with a view to effective ministries as stewards of Christ and the communication of the fruits of biblical, theological, apologetic, historical, and practical studies. These purposes were pursued through the development of a community of teachers and scholars seeking together the meaning of Scripture and its interpretation for human life and the provision of facilities for theological research. The character of the seminary is determined by three great central convictions. First, the Christian religion as set forth in the Westminster Confession of Faith on the basis of Holy Scripture is true. Second, the Christian religion requires and is capable of scholarly exposition and defense. Third, the Christian life is founded upon Christian doctrine as set forth in the Word of God. For further information about the seminary, write to Westminster Theological Seminary, Post Office Box 27009, Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, 19118. Permission for the further reproduction of these messages for the purpose of distribution should be requested from Westminster Theological Seminary, Post Office Box 27009, Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, 19118.